And he was actually sitting alongside of the road whenever Jesus came along. This is a real encounter. But instead of talking about Jesus healing the blind man named Bartimaeus, what I want to do is I want you to see the gospel as Bartimaeus saw the gospel for the first time. And before you can see the gospel, we have to read the text. And so if you would, read along. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. He began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Shut up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see you. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. So what I want you to see first this morning is that this blind man, he represents the sinner. You see, the man and woman who is outside of Christ is in the dark and without hope. They're in sin. To sin means to miss the mark. It, it means to not live to the full potential. In fact, it means that you set your own potential, your own standard of living, and you say, that is what I'm going to stand or fall by. My judgment. And it's good enough. Ultimately, when we do this, we become our own God. We become the center of our own universe. And thus, we're guilty of sin. So as this blind man, as Bartimaeus was in, in the dark physically, so those who are outside of Christ are in the dark spiritually. They live by their own standard of righteousness, and they expect to obtain salvation based on what they find is right and wrong. They're in a hopeless situation because they cannot secure their own salvation. Think about Bartimaeus for a moment. He, he it tells us that he's sitting along the side of the road. That was his entire life. Sitting in the dark, along the road, dirty and filthy. He couldn't help it. He was in the dark, possibly from birth, so he had never seen the light of day. The only thing that he could possibly do is sit alongside the road with his hand out, begging. That's the picture of, of us who are outside of Christ. We're sitting along in the darkness, dirty, begging. And as the man, as Bartimaeus had no chance of seeing again, so whenever we were outside of Christ, we have no chance of seeing eternal life because we're not good enough. There was a, a man who lived a long time ago. His name was John Bunyan. And he wrote this allegorical story called Pilgrim's Progress. And in the Pilgrim's Progress, the main character, Pilgrim's Progress, the main character, his name is Christian. And early in the book, he is confronted with this hopeless despair. Because he recognizes that he's a sinner. And he cries out, What shall I do to be saved? Shortly after he cries out, Bunyan introduces another character named Evangelist. And Evangelist tells him what to do. Or rather, he asks the question, You know, why are you crying out? And here's what Christian says He says, Sir, I perceive by the book in my hand that I am condemned to die. And after that to come to judgment. And I find that I am not willing to do the first, nor able to do the second. Christian then presents his further desperate state to evangelists by saying, I cannot die because I fear that this burden that is upon my back will sink me lower than the grave and I shall fall into hell. And sir, if I be not fit to go to prison, I am not fit, I am sure, to go to judgment and from thence to execution. And the thoughts of these things make me cry. So the sinner is in the darkness without hope. Just like Bartimaeus was in the darkness without hope. But then something happens. 
Bartimaeus is sitting in the dark, and whenever you lose one function, other functions start working better. And so all of a sudden, he hears this commotion, and he hears about this man named Jesus who is walking by. It gives him hope, because he's heard about this Jesus fellow. He's, he's raised the dead. He's cured blindness. Suddenly, Bartimaeus' despair is elevated from despair to there's hope. There's a chance that I will see. And so he exclaims, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This demonstrates that whenever a sinner is confronted with the hope of Jesus, they desire more. I mean, think about a person who is sick. Or think about the last time you were sick. You take a little bit of medicine and suddenly your symptoms start to disappear and you start feeling better. Well, what do you do? You take more medicine because you want to be made well. You want to be healthy again. So those who are in the darkness, when they hear about Jesus and the hope that His, His eternal, His life offers to them, they want that. I mean, remember, the, fact, the effect of sin is death. In addition to this, just this, this, uh, this effect of sin, which is death, the just action of God. I mean, God can't help but to, to, to condemn. So the man or woman who comes under the complete conviction of what they deserve because of their sins, they want to be made well. They want what Jesus offers. Imagine for a moment that, that you're kidnapped and you're held captive. And you're sitting there and you can, see, you can see police walk by. Would you not cry out for help to those who can help you? And if you were free, would you not run so far away from your captors as possible? And so those who are outside of Christ, whenever they recognize, man, I deserve death and God's wrath is just, what shall I do? And they recognize that in Jesus there is not only hope, but there is relief. There is eternal life. And they want that. Not just a little bit, but all of it. And as a result of Jesus passing by Bartimaeus, whenever he called out, Bartimaeus wanted to be delivered from his blindness. He wanted relief. He wanted to be made whole. And his crying out was evidence of this. So does your life show evidence that at one point in your life you cried out to Christ for deliverance? And I'm not talking about, yeah, I've got a date marked out somewhere, William, that tells me that I was saved on this day. I'm saying, is there, is there hope in your life? Is there legitimate, when you look past all of the despair of this world, because you know that your life is laid up in heaven, awaiting Christ to return, or awaiting to go to Him? Do you truly recognize that your life is no longer in the darkness, but rather in the light of Christ? See, as a sick person seeks the help of a doctor to be made well again. So Bartimaeus called after Jesus in order to receive his sight. Unfortunately, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. And in the same way, those accompanying Jesus try to keep Bartimaeus from him, so the world tries to quiet the need of Christ and those who seek after him. That is to say that those who seek Jesus are met with resistance from the world. And this is true. And I don't want to talk about this in a moment. But first, I need you to recognize something about what we read. Those people who, who tried to keep Bartimaeus from Jesus, they were with Jesus. They weren't, they weren't the, the unbelievers or, or the skeptics who said, shut up, he can't help you. They weren't the religious leaders who said, no, no, stay back. No, those people who tried to keep Bartimaeus from Jesus were people who were with him. Do we make it hard for people to come to Jesus? I mean, don't get me wrong. The Bible paints a, a picture of whenever those who come to Christ, it's a difficult path. And we shouldn't say, you know, we shouldn't water that down. I mean, we should paint the picture, you're going to become a Christian, and this is what you're going to encounter. But my question is, do we make it hard for people to come to Jesus by how we present Jesus? What are we like whenever visitors come into church? What kind of barriers do we put up? Are we, 
Are we friendly? Are we, are we kind? Are we loving? Do we act like a, a snobby country club that, oh, well, somebody new is in here. Maybe they'll join, maybe not. And if they do, then I might get to know them. I don't know. I mean, what kind of example do we set for those in the community? Are we gossipers? Are we slanderers? Are we liars? Are we hypocrites? What about the example that we set for those who want to become Christians? Are we legalistic? Or do we give it a liberal interpretation? Are we apathetic? Are we, are we unconvicted of what we so passionately believe? Are your actions keeping people from coming to Jesus? Are our actions as a church keeping people from coming to Jesus? You know, if, if you're a Christian, the last thing that you want to do, the very last thing that you want to do is keep somebody from coming to Jesus by your behavior. You don't want to set up barriers for them. You don't want to run them away from Jesus. You don't want to say, no, no, stay there. He doesn't want you. And that's exactly what the world does. They put up barriers to those who want Christ, who recognize that they need Jesus, and the world says, no, no, you don't need him. You know, truthfully, before, before a person even gets convicted of the sins, they are told by the world, you know what, you're good enough as you are. But yeah, don't do anything bad. I mean, as long as you're not like Hitler or, or Stalin, then you're going to go to heaven. Because they deny that there's any kind of sinful nature that we're born into sin and, and that, that our sins are deserving of wrath. They deny that there's a holy God who can't help but to do the just and, and fair and righteous thing. You see, whenever the power of sin is diminished and people are taught that they can go to heaven by being good, there's absolutely no need for Jesus. No need for him at all. And this is why people get upset whenever somebody comes along and says, you need Jesus for eternal life. Because all along they've been told, no, you don't. You're good enough as you are. You're not a bad person. Don't do these major things, and you're okay. This then presents the problem for the person who's around them who recognizes, no, I'm not good on my own. I am deserving of condemnation, and if God... That's what I deserve. <coughs> and so, then the world immediately around them tries to keep them from Jesus and talks them out of it. In Bunyan's book, he captured this resistance from the world. From the very, very beginning, whenever Christian expresses his concern about his, his burden upon his back, his family discounts him and discredits him. And they say, some frenzy distemper has gotten into his head. And they tell him to go to bed and to sleep it off. And whenever you wake up in the morning, you'll feel better. And then once Christian learns what he must do from evangelist, which is flee the city of destruction, is what evangelist says, and points him up towards this shining light, the cross, ultimately. Bunyan writes, Now he had not run far from his own door, but his wife and children, perceiving it, began to cry after him to return. But the man put his fingers in his ears and ran on crying, Life, life, eternal life. So he looked not behind him, but fled towards the middle of the plain. But Bunyan doesn't stop with Christian's family. He writes on. He says, The neighbors also came out to see him run. And as he ran, some mocked, others threatened, and some cried after him to return. So at this point in the story, Bunyan introduces two more characters. Obstinate and pliable. And they are intent on fetching Christian back by force and to persuade him to come back with them. And the conversation between the three men goes as, as follows. Obstinate says, what are the things you seek since you leave the world to find them? Christian says, I seek an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and that fate is not away. And it is laid up in heaven and fast there to be bestowed at the time appointed on them that diligently seek it. Read it so, if you will, in my book. Tush, said Obstinate. Away with your book. Will you go back with us or not? Christian says, no, not I. Because I have laid my hand to the plow. Obstinate says, come then, neighbor, pliable. Let us turn again and go home without him. 
There's a company of these crazed head coxcombs that when they take a fancy by the end are wiser in their own eyes than seven men that can render a reason. And then Pliable said, don't revile. If what the good Christian says is true, the things he looks after are better than ours, my heart is inclined to go with my neighbor. What? says Austin. More fools still. Who knows where such a brain-sick fellow will lead you? And so the conversation ends with Pliable going along with Christian and obstinate saying, I will go back to my place. I will be no companion of such misled, fantastical fellows. And so it is with those who see Christ today. Family and friends who find Jesus to be absolutely nothing, will try to persuade you otherwise. and say, no, no, you're fine. You've got these crazy ideas in your head. You're, you're, not, you're not yourself. Here, lie down. It, it, you're all caught up in emotion. It's fine. Yet, in all who are outside of Christ, God is calling them to repent. It's not nonsensical stuff, but God desires you to repent. And so it is with those who seek Christ today, just as Bartimaeus, who is being hushed for desiring an audience with Jesus, he hears the call. For Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. And today, Jesus is calling to those he came to save. Scripture unveils God's message clearly. Ezekiel 18.23 says, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? Also, Ezekiel writes, As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Peter writes, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Paul wrote something very similar to Timothy. He said, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he also says, I didn't put it up there, but... Paul also writes to Timothy in, in chapter 2, verse 4. He says that God wants all men to come to repentance and to live. So not only does the scripture reveal God's desire for all to be saved, but Jesus' message is consistent throughout the gospel. He says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Again, Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He also says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And finally, a familiar verse to all of us, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that He, did not, that he gave his, his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Is this your message? Is, it, is your message consistent to those who are listening? Are you com communicating a clear message to those who are, are around you? You know, boys and girls, and, and maybe we've all been there at one time or another, but boys and girls, they sometimes get embarrassed or in trouble whenever they receive a conflicting message from the opposite sex. And in a similar way, those around you can get in trouble whenever they receive a conflicting message about Jesus from you. You know, some Christians, you know, we live our lives as if we've got a bumper sticker on the back of our car that, that quotes John 3, 16. But in reality, whenever we actually live and the way we live, the bumper sticker really says, Jesus loves you, but I think you're a toast. <laughs> if you had a bumper sticker, what would people read? Would it be different than what you actually think it is? Is the message that you're communicating clear? As a Christian, we cannot send conflicting signals to the world around us. That's why sometimes children reject the faith of their parents because they don't see. They don't see it. They receive a conflicting message. The parent says, 
you know what? You need to go to church, or, or you need to read your Bible, or you need to you need to be a Christian. You need to believe in God, but then they don't see that faith acted out in their parents. There was a movie, maybe you saw it one time. It was called Jerry Maguire, starring Tom Cruise and Cuba Gooding Jr. And Tom Cruise is a sports agent, and Cuba Gooding Jr. plays an athlete. And Tom Cruise is on the phone with him, and he says, "What do you want?" Because he's trying to get him. He's trying to sign him up. He says, what, what can I get you? What do you want? And Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character says, money. Show me the money, Jerry. And then there ensues this conversation. Show me the money. No, I want you to scream. Show me the money! See, if people don't see your faith, if you don't show them Jesus, they're not going to want you. And if you show them a Jesus who is not revealed in the Bible, they're definitely not going to want him. Are you communicating to the world around you that God loves them, that God wants them to come to repentance? Is, is your message Jesus' message? The message to Bartimaeus was clear. Come. And upon arriving at Jesus' feet, he made a request. He said, Rabbi, I want to see and at this request, Mark says, immediately he received his sight. So just as Bartimaeus sought to be made whole, so it is today with sinners who come to Jesus. The sinner who desires to be made whole is made whole. Jesus' death upon the cross is so completely awesome and that it satisfies our every need, particularly the need of our soul, it cleanses us. Jesus' death not only justifies the sinner, but also sanctifies them too. Jesus' death justifies us before God. That means that we are declared innocent. To be justified says that you are innocent. You're, even though you're deserving of guilt, you are innocent. That is awesome. Romans 5, 9 says, Since we've now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? So the death of Jesus paid the debt of your unrighteousness. It, it covered over your guilt. But not only does Jesus justify us, but he also sanctifies us. Through his obedience to die upon the cross, you and I, we're declared righteous. Romans says, through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. And then Paul also writes to the Corinthians, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is so abundantly awesome for us to understand this, because here we are, Guilty and unrighteous, unholy, deserving of God's wrath. And Jesus comes along, and in his one righteous act, in his, his one act of obedience, not only declares us innocent, but he also sanctifies us. He makes us holy. That means that there's nothing that we can do to make ourselves any more better before God, because Jesus completely and abundantly declares us holy. And so anything that we do after that is not to justify ourselves. You know, whenever a Christian puts their faith into practice, is not to justify themselves, to make themselves holy, or to sanctify themselves. It is to get rid of all unrighteousness, the sin that is still in our bodies because of our sinful nature, and it is for us to become closer and to look more like Jesus. So whenever Paul writes, that you are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. That is so completely true. Because you go from one thing, unrighteous, to righteous. You go from dirty to clean. It's, it's the bath that you never have to take again because it washes and cleanses your soul. And so in Jesus' death, he met the true need of every single individual who has lived from the point Jesus died all the way up to the point that he returns. His death justifies and sanctifies every single individual who comes to him. And as Jesus says, whosoever shall come. Jesus came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And he calls us as disciples to do the same. Imagine a Jesus that only came to serve. So Jesus shows up on the scene and he's doing miracles. He's a popular guy, but he has no plan to die on the cross. He has no plan to 
actually fulfill the gospel? That's not the kind of Jesus that we want. That kind of Jesus would render Romans 5, 9, 9 19 not true. If Jesus only came to, to do miracles, only came to serve, he didn't come to meet our true needs. But he did. And so whenever we serve, whenever you serve others, are you addressing their true needs? Or are you simply gratifying your own desires? So doing things for others makes us feel good. You can't help it because you see them smile and it makes you feel good. However, if we do not aim to actually reach them with the gospel, then what are we doing? We're missing the mark of Christianity. If we're not aiming to present individuals the gospel of Jesus Christ, we miss the mark of Christianity and we're only gratifying our own desires. We're only indulging in that feel-good feeling. Doing things for others is exactly what the world does because they knew it without the gospel. So serving others without the gospel will only satisfy an insecure faith. However, the true goal of serving others is presenting the gospel to them. And only then will their souls be satisfied. Let me share with you a made-up story. There was a Christian. He visited his elderly neighbor quite often, helped him out a lot, drove him places, took him grocery shopping, really took care of him. And the Christian felt 